Welcome to this morning's service. It's good to see all of you. Um, Lauren and I was able to, were able to get away last weekend and kind of have a little bit of a vacation sort of thing <laughs> up uh, up north. And let me tell you, if you're going to watch the live stream, that's the place to do it. <laughs> um, well, I want to welcome you, all of you here and also everyone on, on the live stream. It's so good that you're here. Uh, we're going to start the service with uh, with a song. So if you all want to stand, if you're able. Um, it's kind of weird to say now because we haven't done that. I haven't done it in a while, but um, yeah, let's sing. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Awesome was that to, you guys can sit. How awesome was that to be able to hear one another sing again, eh? 
How cool. Well, welcome everyone. So good to see you. Let's just welcome anyone who might be visiting with us, maybe visiting online. Very special welcome to you watching us on live stream. So we do have a few announcements that I want to take us through. Here we go. Thank you so much for social distancing. Remember to do that. I know we're getting all excited about being able to get together again and so forth. And some of the restrictions are lifting a bit, but we do need to, uh, to still respect the social distancing rules. So six feet apart, okay? Uh, but do your best uh, on that. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Silence your cell phone. Please don't assume that it's on or off, uh, on mute and or off. Please double check that and because uh, it can be a little bit distracting as we go through the service. So thank you for that. At home, silence your cell phone. I don't want to hear it here. All right. BIC online. So take note, July 18th is going to be a special Sunday. So there will be no church here in the morning. Church will strictly be at home, but there will be an uh, early evening service at 6.30, and we are actually going to do communion at that outdoor service as well, because we'll be outdoors. We're going to participate in communion together, uh, so take note of that. So 6.30 p.m. here at Club C uh, on Sunday, July 18th, but we will also be having an online service just in case it's bad weather and we do have to cancel the outdoor service. You'll have at least had church that week with us, which will be great. So, what else we got here? <clears throat> Online prayer time. Don't forget that Pastor Larry and Sharon, you can connect with them if you want to be involved in an online prayer group. Uh, Charmaine's prayer group has been uh, postponed for summertime, but I just want to encourage everyone to still send in your prayer requests to either Charmaine or myself. Let us know about any updates, any things that are going on. Because we want to, we do pray as a staff team as well uh, on Wednesday mornings for the needs of our church. So uh, make sure you take advantage of connecting with people to let us know your prayer requests. The Rise Youth. Um, I'm not sure. Where's Caleb? Hey, hi, Caleb. Welcome back. Uh, so this says. Tuesday at 7 p.m., but you guys are on a break as well, I think, right? Um, this week, we are going to be doing it. Oh, yeah, awesome. Well, there you go. So the Rise, grades 5 to 12, is on Tuesday night, and that's on the YouTube channel, correct? WBIC students. And like I said, adults, if you want to have some fun, if you want to pretend you're young, you can go on it too, like kind of incognito. So, all right, what else? Oh, yes, dates and destinations for the Operation Explore. So that's with Charmaine. She has a trip to Cuba, a trip to Zambia, and a trip to Nepal. Uh, those aren't real trips in the sense of you won't actually go there, but if you go onto your computer, she will take you on a tour through those countries, uh, and it's pretty exciting. But she doesn't want to know if you're going to participate in that, so send her an email or talk to her this morning uh, and just let her know that you're interested or if you have any more questions about it. And lastly, that's it. So... Awesome. I think, is it back to you then? Yeah. Awesome. Back to worship. So you know, if you want to stand again, <laughs> getting our workout out. <laughs>
my God is love. up all the time, but you give us love, God. You give us grace when we don't deserve it, because you are God. You are love, God. That's who you are. Amen. Good morning. I'm Pastor Larry, and I cannot see you. The Lord is good, and as we've been singing this morning, 10,000 reasons to bless his holy name. I sat in a staff meeting on Thursday this week with the rest of the team, and I was sharing some things that the Lord has been doing. Pastor Andrew asked me if I would share that this morning, and I said, sure, be glad to. So let me give you the very brief synopsis of the thing we've been praying about. As you know, we talked to you a couple weeks ago about a man that was healed of cancer. We give God praise for that. Uh, Sunday, a man came up to me and told me about a habit that's been his for a long time. And the Lord has broken that habit. We give God praise. Four years ago at South Niagara, where I work two days a week, one of the gals said, this building right next to us, it's hooked to us, we're in the middle of the building, there's Avondale, there's us, and then there's this building over here to the left. And it's used one day a week. And that hardly seems worth the while for that person to go there one day a week, even just for three or four hours and work. She said, you know, Jer um, Jericho was claimed by Joshua. She said, I have an idea. Why don't we stand up against the wall? I think there were seven or eight of us. And we just put our hands up on the wall. And we claimed that, that uh, building for ourselves for the work of God and the kingdom. I suppose if anyone was looking in, they would have thought we were crazy or there was a stick up, one or the other. <laughs> but we prayed, and we've been praying for four years. Back in November, the lady came over and said, if this building is up for sale, which it is, we promised you a first grab at the building. 4,800 square feet, and the price is $125,000. That's absolutely ludicrous in these days, for that price. So we began to pray that God would do it. Well, to the glory of God, I will tell you this morning that a man walked in on Tuesday, handed Leighton, our treasurer, a check for $125,000. There's a ministry in New York State that usually sends us $1,000 U.S. I think last year it was $1,500. The next day after this check we got from this 
brother for the building, another check came in from this ministry in the States, $5,000. God is good. This morning as I was awakened by five, at 5 o'clock thinking about this prayer time, I said, Lord, what do you have for our people today in terms of this prayer? And I, 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 won't, get, I won't quote it to you. I'm, I'm going to probably pray it over you this morning. And not just you that are out there that can see me, but you out there that are online and perhaps even into this spirit realm, I will proclaim this today because this is the word of the Lord. And God is out to bless his people. God is doing marvelous things in these crazy days which we live. In spite of the negativism, all that stuff, God is doing marvelous things. So let me not talk anymore to you. Let me talk about you to God. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so thankful for your wonderful, marvelous love and grace, your faithfulness, your expressions of love to us day by day. Perhaps sometimes we get so busy that we even fail to stop and say, thank you, Lord, for this blessing. Last night, just because of the, um, the hurry of the day, and we weren't all that hungry, Sharon just said, would you like soup and sandwich? Okay. <laughs> and it was so good, soup and a sandwich. Doesn't sound like much. But Father, when I think about our children in this world, would give their eye teeth for a meal like that. I couldn't help but just thank you for the soup and sandwich and a piece of pie. So good. So many blessings you pour out on your people. And so, Father, this morning as we praise you and give honor to you, you promised your people back in the book of Deuteronomy if you will diligently obey the Lord your God, be careful to do all of his commandments, which I command you today. You have told us you would set, upon, set them on high above all the nations. Your blessings would come upon them, overtake them, if they obeyed your word. You told them they would be blessed in the city, blessed in the country. You would bless their offspring, the produce of the ground, even the beasts of the field. You would increase the herd, the young flock, you told that those who are doing the cooking in the kitchen that their basket would be full, their kneading bowl would be blessed. You told them that they would be blessed when they came in and when they went out. You told them that the Lord would cause their enemies to rise up against you would be defeated because you were going ahead of them. You said, Lord, that you would bless them in their barns and all that they possessed. You would bless them in the land which the Lord had given them. You told them that you would establish them as a holy people, and you went on and so many other blessings in this chapter. Father, in the name of Jesus today, that's what we proclaim over this, the church of the living Christ. Not only we, the body of Christ here, but Lord, as I've been thinking this week, to pronounce blessing over Welland. It's really just two words, the well land. Father, make it a well land as we intercede for our city today, as we intercede for the church, as we intercede for the nation. Lord, a week from today, we'll celebrate, uh, probably, some way, shape, or form, the birth of Canada. And Lord, it's been prophesied by a number of great big names that before this world ends, a revival would stretch from shore to shore, and that's what this country was built on, on that promise, that your blessing would be, your dominion would be from shore to shore. So we intercede for the nation today. Father, I was thinking of the shofar, and I, I can't remember his name. He, he used to come to the church on, on Lincoln Street. He left his shofar behind. I've always been attracted by the sound of the shofar. And I've tried to blow it. It's just about, I don't know what, but it, uh, it's hard. But I love the sound of it because it invokes your blessing. It's a signal that the children of Israel used to blow the shofar when a battle was on. They used to blow the shofar in worship to you and say, the Lord is near. The Lord is ready to pour out of his spirit. As I heard a man say the other day, I believe it was in Cuba, and he had packed his shofar in the car that he was traveling in. And I, I guess for whatever reason, he was not allowed to blow it, but somehow somebody had seen it, and there's a group of people around his vehicle, and they said, sir, we want you to blow that thing. He said, I can't because it's against the law. Come on, blow it. Now, I don't know if he broke the law or not, but he accommodated those people, and he blew that shofar. And, Father, 
as they did, a lady began to praise the Lord, and they thought, what is happening here? That lady heard the first sound that she'd ever heard in her life. Father, that's the kind of things you want to do in our time. You want to reveal us signs and wonders and miracles and things that we don't even, can't even imagine. So, Father, today, as we listen to your word, and, Father, we're going to hear about a woman who was barren. But you opened up her womb, and we have a great man named Samuel as a result of what you did. Father, there are so many things that we're seeing these days, and, and as your Spirit has told me very clearly, you haven't seen one iota of what I'm about to do and what I want to do, if my people will just believe me. So, Father, we want to tell you this morning we love you, not because of what you give us in terms of money, not because you have blessed us with a building, not because you have blessed us with a person who gave that money, but because God is faithful. And Father, I have little idea this morning, and I'd like to just suggest to these people, I don't care what the need is. If I have to wait after service, it's okay. If somebody is in need today, need a miracle, Father, give us faith to believe that our God reigns. We sing these songs, we praise you, we bless you because you are faithful. So Father, this morning we intercede for this nation. We pray for the church. We pray that we will be the church, Lord, and that as you promised in Matthew 16, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So, Father, we're looking to you today. Be glorified as we listen to your word today, as we go about this day, Father, and this week. May, Father, we see the wonderful, strange, and marvelous things that only our God can do. So, Father, we worship you and release all rights of ownership. But, Father, I wouldn't be so selfish as to pray for Canada. There are other nations of the world that are rocking and reeling and not knowing which way to turn. Men's hearts failing them for fear for the things coming on the earth. But Father, these are wonderful days for the child of God, for those who put their trust in Christ. Father, we thank you that we were able to come out of that grave. But it isn't just being alive. It's being alive in the realm of the Holy Spirit and listening and ever walking in obedience. So the things we read this morning and prayed will be the things that we experience because our God reigns. We love you, Lord Jesus. We give you praise and glory. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Well, we are going to continue on in our Heroes series. One thing that I've been noting uh, as we've been going along in this Heroes series, and maybe you've possibly noted this connection as well, is that the sovereignty of God seems to continually repeat itself as as kind of an underlying theme. And so the series itself could have maybe even been sovereignty. And what's interesting is we're going to be looking again and seeing the sovereignty of God through a special hero in our scriptures this morning. If you have a Bible or you have a Bible app, whatever it might be, we're going to be looking primarily at 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Again, just want to welcome everyone online who's been a part of this. In uh, next Sunday, we're going to be starting a new series called Job. And uh, I thought it was interesting because I was, we didn't get to really speak about Job in terms of a hero, but he's certainly a hero of Scripture as well. And we're going to continue to see that underlying theme uh, very evident in that God is sovereign. And we are going to be looking at that uh, through the book, through uh, the month of July in the book of Job. So 1 Samuel teaches us a lot. But it certainly, again, teaches us and reminds us about the sovereignty of God. Now, you've heard me say a couple times that many of us believe in the sovereignty of God. We as Christ followers, we as Christians, we, we know what that means. It means he's almighty. It means he's in charge. It means he's in control of all things. Yet, sometimes we don't act like that. As Christ followers. And it's not that we don't act like that in terms of we act poorly or badly. It's the fact that we don't necessarily believe it at times, even though we do, if that makes sense to you. And so I want to continue to challenge us around that idea, around this kind of minor theme, this underlying theme of God's sovereignty to say if you claim it, you need to believe it. And if you believe it, you need to act like it's true. So what does that mean? Well, it could look like this. It could mean that all the territory is within God's jurisdiction. It means you believe that he's sovereign over this entire world, over this entire universe. It means that every person is under his authority. 
under his control. It means that all the events are in his hands. Remember that children's song, that awesome children's song? He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world. I'll sign autographs later. (laughs) Just teasing. But it does. It means that everything is in his grasp. All of God's plans and purposes are moving toward his accomplishment. And that's important to note. It's not about our accomplishments, but it's about his glory and his accomplishments. He makes use of all the antagonistic facts and forces, all the naysayers. And he uses all of his facts and all of his forces to prove those naysayers wrong. Paul makes these comments in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20-21. He says, God uses both vessels unto, unto honor and vessels unto, unto dishonor. 1 Samuel, the book of 1 Samuel, also teaches us that God's ultimate victory is independent of us. Now that's interesting. See, God doesn't need us for his sovereignty But in his grace, and we spoke about, we sang about his kindness, he wants to use us to reveal his sovereignty. But he doesn't need us. And sometimes we trip that up. So God's ultimate victory is independent of our attitudes and our actions, but nevertheless, the ultimate destiny of us as individuals and groups depends on our actions towards him. Our attitudes and our actions do not determine God's ultimate victory, but they do determine our destiny. See, our actions and attitudes reflect our destiny and determine our destiny. And ultimately, that means whether we will spend an eternity in heaven with God praising him or an eternity in hell. God's sovereignty allows him to use all people, loyal and rebellious. We see in scripture, God uses a donkey. A couple different times, actually, if you want to look at it that way. But it's all to produce his ultimate purpose. However, we determine the outcome of our lives by our attitudes and our responses to him. But we see these principles work themselves out throughout scripture. And this morning's hero is an incredible lady named Hannah. Hannah means grace and or favor. What a great name. Many of you may be familiar with the story of Hannah, and we're going to look at it in just a moment in the actual scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and into chapter 2 as well. But there's several things that we get to learn about Hannah. We get to observe and see what a prayer life can look like. This woman of prayer, and that's probably primarily what we think about Hannah for those of us who are familiar with the story. But we also get to see great persistence, great persistence in Hannah. We get to see patience. How many of you need a little extra dose of patience, (laughs) myself included. (laughs) Anderson has this new car. This is a sideline, but it works into patience, and he wants to drive so much, and and I want to do that for him, but I honestly feel like I'm in a roller coaster with him sometimes, and he loves to, it's a 5.7 liter Hemi, and the thing is fast. Uh, And he likes to do what's called drift a little bit. So he kind of spins the back end around a little bit here and there. And this morning he did it, and I wasn't really expecting it. And my shoulder slammed into the side of the car when he corrected the the back end. And I thought, that hurt. Um, And in my head, I was like, I just need patience, Lord. I need patience for this next season of life with my son. So... 
but it's also a very enjoyable time. His car is here, actually. He lets me drive it sometimes, so, so I have his car today. It's pretty exciting. Anyway, so she examples us patience. But out of her prayer, her persistence, and her patience, and the promise that she made to God for what he would do for her, comes this. And this is what I want you to remember. And I kind of have it up to here. It's all to thee. All to thee I surrender. See, Hannah's greatest example for us is this. Yes, she examples prayer. Yes, she examples persistence. Yes, she examples patience. But she, she examples to us perfect surrender. Perfect submission. So let's go to the story a little bit. And the book of 1 Samuel tells us of three main characters. Samuel, who is, we're going to see very shortly here, is Hannah's son. And then Saul and David, the first two kings, respectively, of the Israel of nation. The writer of 1 Samuel is unknown. However, some biblical scholars, and we likely believe it to be Samuel, but it wasn't necessarily him, even though it's named after him. One distinction between the Hebrew Bible, and some of you may know this, is there's no first and second Samuel in the actual original Hebrew. It's just one book called Samuel. I believe it's the same, it might be the same for Chronicles and or Kings as well. Uh, they don't make a division as to what our Bible makes in that. But we in our Bible have the book of first Samuel and second Samuel, but in the original Hebrew Bible, uh, it would just be Samuel. The name Samuel in Hebrew is Shmel. How do you like that? Shmel. And his nickname would have been Shmelik. <laughs> it's so awesome to say, to pronounce Hebrew words sometimes. Which means this, and you'll remember this story as well. Remember the story of Samuel when it means here's God. And you remember that story when he was a young man, a young boy, and he hears the voice, and he goes to Eli, and he's like, why are you calling me? And he's like, I'm not the one calling you. God is calling you. And so Samuel means God hears. His parents were Elkanah and Hannah. The book was written approximately around 1100 BC, many years ago, which was a transitional time in Israel. They moved from the time of being having judges to rule over them to a time of kings. He operated, Samuel himself operated as one of the last judges and one of the first prophets and also served in the role as priest as well. And in fact, was uh, of the Levite tribe himself. So this morning, we'll look at how the Lord wants us to be people of prayer, perseverance, patience, that ultimately is going to lead to perfect submission. The story begins off with Samuel's birth, and we learn about how God helped his mother Hannah conceive after many years of infertility. It was interesting, we had to make an announcement the other day. Um, we had to tell some exciting news to Charmaine's dad. He had come and visited us with his new wife. And, uh, and so Michaela was at the dinner table with us and she didn't know what we were talking about. And I said, well, should Charmaine was like, did you tell dad yet? And I was like, no, did you tell him? And we were like, okay, let's tell him now. And Michaela was like, what's going on? And so I blurted out, Charmaine's pregnant. It's supposed to be funny. You don't have to groan at that. <laughs> I know some of you know of our infertility journey, and some of you are like, what, is, is she, isn't she, what's going on? No, she's not pregnant, and I don't know whether to say praise the Lord to that or not. It'd be really interesting to, if she did get pregnant at this stage. I'm not sure what I'd do with that, but, uh, but yeah, no, we, we shared with them something different. But some of you, and Charmaine and I have struggled with this at, at a stage in our life, this this hard, hard thing, and unfortunately, it's becoming more common amongst younger couples, is infertility. And we see a few examples of this difficult, tough struggle in young couples' lives, and we see this in the life and the story of Hannah. Elkanah, Hannah's husband, lived in the town of Ramathim, which is thought to have been located approximately four or five miles away from Jerusalem. This Elkanah is an interesting character in Scripture, this husband of Hannah. He was a devout man, according to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 3, 
which says this. It says, year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice the Lord Almighty at Shiloh. Shiloh was approximately 15 miles away from his hometown, and it is believed to be where the tabernacle was located at the time before the temple was built. Now, what's interesting about Elkanah, Hannah's husband, is he actually had another wife. And he gets another wife because, unfortunately, Hannah cannot fulfill her wifely duty in this context, in this culture, of supplying Elkanah children. And so he marries Peninnah. The inference here is that uh, Hannah was not able to have children, so he married Peninnah to have children by her. According to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 4 to 5, Elkanah's real love was for Hannah, though. This is what he says. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of meat to his wife, Peninnah, and to her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. Now, even though he loved Hannah, he didn't really have a full understanding of the pain she felt concerning her infertility. And why do I say this? This this is just me. This is not a biblical scholar comment. This is not something I researched. But as I read through the story, I I was frustrated with Elkanah, the husband. I was even a little angered because I felt if he truly loved Hannah, he would have journeyed through this with her. And I think there's, this isn't in the notes, but I think it's a quick lesson for us to just take note of. When our spouse is going through something or a dear friend or a dear loved one, we should go through that with them. We shouldn't be looking for the quick fix per se or going somewhere else to, to get something that someone can't give us. And so I felt a little disturbed myself with Elkanah. And I know it was just customary. It was part of the culture. Hey, you know, it was just normal, unfortunately. If my wife can't give me babies, then I find another woman who can. And I marry her, and she produces the family for me. But there was a frustration for me in Elkanah in that I feel like he could have done a better job of sacrificing his own desire to live in the pain with his wife, Hannah. 1 Samuel 1 verse 8 says, Elkanah, even her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I, and then he has the arrogance to say this, don't I mean more to you than ten sons? She's thinking, dude, you don't get it. You're not understanding the pain that I'm going through. Hannah was not the first woman mentioned in the Bible who wrestled with infertility. However, she was the first woman whose heart was open for us to see some of the emotional and spiritual pain associated with infertility. A list of other women mentioned in the Bible includes Sarai, or Sarah, and Abraham, Rachel, and Jacob, Manoah's wife, who doesn't have a name in Scripture, but she's the mother of Samson, How about Elizabeth in the New Testament, John the Baptist's mother? There's no doubt that Hannah was and is a remarkable woman and certainly a hero of our scriptures. She models to us what to do in response to a painful situation, the specific painful situation of infertility. But she also models to us how to manage life's deep disappointments, as well as what to do when facing difficult personal struggles. So the three things we wanted to point out this morning, prayer. It's obvious that Hannah was a prayer warrior, and I'll put that in quotations. We've heard that expression, prayer warrior. Some of you are prayer warriors yourself. I sense, not not too many of you have come to me and said this to me, but I know what's happening. I know that some of you, at least some of you, have been praying for me through this season of COVID. It's been a difficult season. It's a very interesting side note here. I I had a gentleman, I was in the 
Rona store the other day. Uh, look, I was in the trim aisle. I was looking for some trim. Charmaine are replacing a bit of uh, baseboard and quarter around in the house. And I'm in the trim aisle, and this gentleman comes up to me, and you know the guys who are wearing the, um, the masks that kind of look like the train robber masks, right? And he had a hat on, so I could barely recognize him, and I actually didn't recognize him, but all I kind of saw was this. And he came up right into my face, and he got in about six inches in front of me, and he said, you're that guy who burned the church down, aren't you? And I was like, interesting. I said, no, I'm not the guy who burnt the church down. And then he went on to swear explicitly at me, right in my face, over and over again. He called me several really interesting names. And in my head, all I could think was, Andrew, if this was 10 years earlier, you would probably be doing something about this and not the right thing. And then he pulled out his camera and he started to tape me. And he kept trying to goat me into doing something inappropriate, I'm sure. I'm sure he was hoping I would maybe hit him or something or whatever. And I just didn't. And it's those types of things, I don't know, like sometimes you'll hear someone come up to you and they're like, I was praying for you at this time of day. And I'll be like, well, that's interesting. Because you know what happened during that time of day. And so we know of these stories. And so we see this incredible example, and I don't know if anybody was praying at that time. Uh, if you were, thanks so much. Because um, nothing happened. At, well, he did post the video online. Uh, he shared it with Caleb, actually, which was really fun. And Caleb watched it and said, wow, that's interesting. And then deleted it, which was nice. But yeah, it was, it was quite a scene. But we know of those people who are praying for us at different moments in our lives. Well, we don't necessarily know that from Hannah here, but we know that Hannah is in deep distress in her own prayer for this situation of just desiring and wanting a child. She was committed to prayer, but not only because she wanted a child, although that was certainly part of it, but also because she knew this, and this is a great point for those of you who journal or write things down, you might want to take note of this. She knows that prayer is the remedy to a hurting heart. See, she's begging that the definition of prayer, if you look it up in some dictionaries, it'll say to beg. She's begging the Lord for a child out of her barrenness, out of her infertility. But not only is she doing that, she's recognizing and admitting that God is sovereign and that he is the one that can heal the brokenhearted, which is exactly who she is in this situation. When we find ourselves in difficult situations, we should commit ourselves to prayer. But not just in difficult situations all the time, but certainly in these difficult situations. In prayer, we should seek what is best for God primarily. Did you hear me there, church, friends, family? Let me repeat that. In prayer, we should seek what is best for for God, primarily. See, the mistake is we make a wish list for God with our prayers. And then we get frustrated when our wish list or our Christmas list doesn't get met. And God's shaking his head going, this isn't about you <laughs> as much as you want it to be. This is about me and my glory and my kingdom and my will being done. Because the purpose of prayer is to enable us to accomplish God's will, not to get him to do what we want him to do for us. And that's according to Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 10. When we feel a need, we should pray. That's okay. Jesus tells us that. He says, seek and you will find. He gives us a lot of example on how to pray as well. But he wants our heart to be in the right place. And it shouldn't be about a wish list. But he wants us to pray earnestly. When we pray like this, God enables us to have peace within our problems. Look at what Philippians chapter 4 verses 6 to 7 says. It says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, 
by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. But then look at the next verse. Right away, he, Paul says this. He says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So all understanding means when we don't understand. And we pray that. We pray, Lord, I don't understand why I'm going through this. And Philippians tells us that a peace comes over us no matter what because we're praying in the right spirit. We're praying that God's will would be done in these situations. Hannah described herself as being a woman of bitterness of soul, 1 Samuel 1, verse 10. A woman of misery, verse 11. A woman who was deeply troubled, verse 15. And a woman in great anguish and great grief, in verse 16. (laughs) Hannah knew that the only one who could heal her was God. It wasn't going to be her husband, Elkanah. It wasn't going to be Eli the priest. It wasn't going to be a neighbor. It wasn't going to be a friend or any other person in the world. But the one to heal her heart would be God and God alone. It reminds me of the famous song, and I printed out the lyrics because I know how much you guys love to hear me sing. And the song is this. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. Amen? Amen. We have a privilege to carry our concerns to God, but God wants our concerns to line up with his will. As we continue on, we want to look at the perseverance of Hannah. Hannah continues to seek the Lord and trust him despite the opposition or the misunderstanding of others. Elkanah questioned her and He had let it be known, and he had even said, aren't I better than ten sons? How many of us husbands do this when our wives are in? (laughs) We try to fix it by bringing out the better situation, right? So our wives are going through something difficult. They're frustrated, all these things. They're maybe even crying. And we're sitting there like the duh husbands that we are, and we're kind of like, well, yeah, babe, but what about this? And she's going, you're so dense. You're such a ding-dong. And Elkanah falls guilty of this situation, the poor guy. Hannah continued to seek the Lord and trust him, trust God, despite the opposition and the misunderstanding of others. Elkanah had questioned her, and, and uh, Peninnah, oh, Peninnah, what a piece of work this girl is. She keeps provoking and irritating Hannah year After year, whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord for prayer, she would provoke her till she wept and she would not eat. Talk about a bully. Penina means pearl, which is somewhat unfitting, unless you were to say it this way, what a gem she was. (laughs) Penina, an extreme bully in the scripture. She mocked Hannah and her pain. But Hannah's name means grace and favor. And that's the kind of person she was. And it's worth noting that we don't ever see Hannah retaliate against Peninnah in the scripture. Not only did her husband question her and Peninnah provoked her, but she was also accused by the local priest Eli of being drunk. 1 Samuel 1, verse 12 to 16 says, As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. (laughs) Eli thought that she was drunk and said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. 
Hannah says, not so, my Lord. I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer, as you say, but rather I am pouring out my soul to the Lord. Some of you can probably relate to this type of agony of prayer. We see a similar prayer of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, in the Garden of Gethsemane where he's pouring out his heart, where he's saying, Lord, if there, if God, if my father, if there'd be any other way of making this happen. But Jesus also exampled in prayer for us, not my will, but your will be done. Hannah says, I have been praying here out of my great anguish and my grief. Hannah, however, was unmoved, and she was undeterred by all of the negativity expressed by others. Instead, she was determined to remain hopeful and prayerful, and to indeed persevere. Like Hannah, we must persevere and keep following after the Lord. Jesus also spoke of this in a parable of the the persistent widow in Luke chapter 18. You might want to take note of that for some faith at home homework. And look that up later on this week sometime. We see patience exampled in Hannah. 1 Samuel 1, chapter 19 to 20 says, Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then they went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah lay with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. The Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son, She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. Now, notice the Bible says this, friends and family and church. The Bible says, in the course of time. We don't know the timeline here. The Bible doesn't give us that. Was it a few weeks after they laid together and she became pregnant? Was it perhaps another three years? What we do know is she was given a promise by the priest that God would bless her, and she still had to continue to wait and be patient with that promise. Psalm 27 verse 14 says, Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart, and wait for the Lord. How many of you are patient people? (laughs) Not many of us, right? We just live in a hurried culture. It's all around us. But remember this. Patience is a part of the fruit of the Spirit. And it's actually not optional for the Christ follower. You can't say when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, well, I'm kind and I'm good. And I'm, you know, uh, a few of the other things of the nine there, gentle, But patience, that's someone else's department. If I hit seven of the nine, I'm doing awesome. Like, that's a really good score, Pastor. Uh Uh-uh. Nine out of nine for Christ followers when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit. Psalm 130, verse 5 says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I will put my hope. It is crucial, church family, to remember that God is never late. Remember that. (laughs) We think he is, but he's not. God is never late, and unfortunately for us, he's never in a rush. Come on, God, hurry this up a little bit. It's been one day, Lord. God, it's been 27 hours now. Lord, are you kidding me? 72 hours? Come on. What's up with you, God? God's timeline is not our timeline. God's delay, I love this line. God's delay is often for his display. Write that one down. Quote that on Facebook. God's delay is often for his display, and obviously for his greater glory. No matter how hard it is, 
We need to learn how to pray, we need to persevere, and we need to be patient. Lastly, we see the promise fulfilled. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. 1 Samuel 1, verses 11 says this, and she made a vow, she made a promise. O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, I will give him back to the Lord for all the days of his life. When Charmaine and I were going through infertility and we were praying for the process of adoption and receiving a child, I must confess there was no part of me that said, Lord, if you give me a little baby, I'll give it back to you. It's unfortunate. Hopefully I'll grow and mature to become someone who's willing to surrender all. I can't imagine what it would have been like to be Hannah. To have waited for something for so long. (laughs) Such a precious thing. And then to follow through with the promise of giving the one thing she desired so much back to the Lord. Now, it's maybe not all that terrible. Scripture tells us that she visited him once a year and brought him back his robe. The scripture tells us it's really interesting that she, she did this. Uh, oftentimes, we kind of think that as soon as the child was born, he, he went to Eli. But it says, actually, the scripture says, after he was weaned. In this culture, we're assuming the weaning was maybe three to five years old. We don't know. But a young, certainly a very young boy when he went with Eli. When we consider how Hannah must have felt the day she knelt down and kissed her little boy's cheeks and hugged his little frame and said goodbye, we have to recognize this lesson, church, friends, and family. And the lesson is this perfect surrender to God. The hardest thing we will ever have to do as Christ followers is surrender our Samuel. So who is your Samuel? Is your Samuel perhaps your spouse? Is your Samuel your career? Is your Samuel some form of status or pride for you? Is your Samuel your children? What is your Samuel this morning, or who is your Samuel? What is God asking you this morning to fully surrender to him? What's interesting in the story, and sometimes we forget this, and this is incredible to me, in 1 Samuel 2, verse 21, it says this, It says, and the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore three more sons and two more daughters. I call that the blessing of surrender. Now, I'm not trying to confuse this at all with prosperity gospel. Please hear me. That is not what I'm saying here. But I do believe in the principle that when we surrender, even the most difficult things, even the things that we desire most, and we lay them down and we give them over to Christ, he blesses that. He may bless it financially. He may bless it Numerically, somehow, I I don't know what it looks like, but the principle is that he will bless it. And even if you don't see the specific blessing the way you want to, the underlying theme is that God is sovereign and his will is to be done, not ours. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up and we're going to sing 
I surrender all. Now, some of you are hand raisers in worship, and that's great. Some of you aren't, and that's great. The reason I raise hands is because it's a form of surrender. Stick them up. God might be asking you or wanting to teach you, and this may be the very first time, and again, no pressure at all, but you may, during this song at some point, feel the Holy Spirit say to you, just in a small act of obedience this morning, stick them up. Surrender it. It might be a grief. It might be a frustration. It might be a pain. It might be a person. It might be a situation. Whatever it is, many of us have something that we could probably say this morning, God, I surrender all. Take this. Work with this in me. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Amen. Amen. Bless you, church. Let's stand and sing.
to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. I hope you all have a great week.